Okay, we're going to go from here to Dr. Evans' topic. So, injections, radiofrequency ablation, and stimulator treatment. So, epidural steroid injections are one of the things you can do. And you can fill up the canal on one side and bathe the nerve in the root and even a portion of the anterior facet. You can do a transforaminal epidural steroid injection where instead of filling the canal from here, you fill it from here. And sometimes you have to do that. If somebody's had prior surgery, there's no good anatomic landmarks here. Dr. Evans has to come from here. You can do a selective nerve block, which is a TFESI, but only partial because as the root comes out, you're only involving the root and not the canal. And there's caudal blocks. I mean, the amount of a number of blocks, you can inject anything, any place, and they're very valuable. So injections can be pars blocks. So if you're not sure if that pars fracture is causing the pain, Dr. Evans can infiltrate the pars around the outside of it, and we can determine whether that pars block gives the patient relief versus the nerve root. What if the nerve root is caught underneath that? You're going to have some pain that radiates down, but it can mimic a pars. So these kinds of blocks are highly effective to tell me what's going on, and it's important that Dr. Evans be precise, and thank God we have him because there are guys that are not as precise, unfortunately. So if you have iodine allergy, you can have these blocks performed without contrast, but contrast is helpful for Dr. Evans to see where everything is, and we'll talk about this. So this is what a steroid effect does onto the nerve root. Substance P expression at the dorsal root is decreased significantly with steroids. They inhibit the production of prostaglandins and leukotrienes through the arachidonic acid pathway. They make the root membranes less permeable to the environment. Why is that important? Because that disc herniation is full of noxious chemicals, and so it's less exposed. And in my opinion, the single best treatment for a painful radiculopathy other than surgery, and sometimes even better. So effects of the anesthetics. There's two things injected generally, actually three, when you do a block. One is the dye because you're trying to figure out if you're in the right spot. Number two, you're the steroid. And number three, you have an anesthetic. You have lidocaine or marcaine. And so that's, for me, one of the most important things because anesthetic agents block the sodium channels of the root. Now, you might expect a full and complete block of the nerve root. If you put that anesthetic on the root, shouldn't the root stop functioning totally? Makes sense, doesn't it? But no, depending on, remember, you have the dural membrane that filters this material. So I'm going to leave Dr. Evans to tell me how do you get a full block with a motor spinal block, and how do you determine just what lidocaine or marcaine dosage you use? So lidocaine more short-acting, obviously, would be a shorter window of feedback either sensory or motor. Yes. Um, and Is there a concentration of anesthetic that will give you a motor block every time versus ones that generally won't? Okay. So it depends on how it's injected and the concentration and the volume. So the dural sleeve filters these agents and it will anesthetize the nociceptors and sensory roots but interestingly enough, most of the time, motor and proprioception is preserved. So the location of the DRG might have something to do with it. Have you found doing an epidural versus doing an TFESI creates a change? Yeah, I mean, when, you, when you're asking me to be very specific and say, is this brain and this nerve root, then I'm more lateral to the pedicle and, and you don't get as much epidural update, so you're more trying to be that selective nerve. 
literally go a little bit deeper past the head of the shadow, more centrally, and that'll get more broader epidural spread brain more therapeutic there. So less, less diagnostic for you. Patient feels better. So it's your, it's your first technique to get the excellent It depends what Dr. Corbin is asking for. Is he oh, asking for something more therapeutic? Is he just trying to make the patient comfortable or is he trying to be more Does specific and set himself up for surgery possibly? Okay. So that's where like the collaboration comes in great. You know, Absolutely. I lean on him a lot to tell me what the pain generator is. So epidurals and motor weakness that can occur Steroids reduce the pain, but you have to uh, affect the circulation around the root. So if you have an, had a herniated disc with motor weakness, you give them an epidural, what do you do? You get rid of their pain, but you don't get rid of their compression. So it's a false sense of security. You give somebody an epidural, somebody comes in with a red hot L5 radic with a foot drop, and I send them to Dr. Evans, I know they will get pain relief, but they will not get motor strength recovery because it doesn't take the compression away, it takes the inflammation away. Inflammation is what causes the nerves to get pissed off in the first place. So it gives a false sense of improvement, and you've got to educate the patient because that motor deficit may not improve. Remember the 40, 80 percent patients with a significant motor deficit have a 40% chance of improvement without surgery, 80% chance with. So you have to be careful with this, using these. You have to ask patients about dental alveolar blocks. So have you gone to a dentist before? Oh yeah. Have they injected your jaw? Oh yeah. Does it work? No, it almost never works. So they've got to put three or four injections in there. They may have a resistance to Marcaine or lidocaine, and if they do, you're not going to get a diagnostic block. So if I'm looking for Dr. Evans to tell me it's the L4 root, and I send them for an injection, and we don't find out about their resistance, they're going to end up having a block and no relief. And I'm going to think, am I wrong with my diagnosis? So you've got to be careful to ask people about this. You can use the prior experience. So always ask them if they had an injection and what the results of the injection have been. Again, we talked about lidocaine marcaine resistance. So diagnostic versus therapeutic injections, a big deal. If you go to a typical injectionist, his or her goal is to get rid of your pain. That's what their goal is. So they're gonna inject a huge bolus of lidocaine or marcaine with steroid and try and cover as many levels as they can, which is great for the patient to relieve pain but what has it told me about what their pain provocator is? Nothing. So if you do a large L4, 5 injection and you cover 3, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 1 and you get relief, I can't tell you what the pain generator is. If Dr. Evans just does the L5 root and the pain goes away, that tells me a lot. So that's really the difference between diagnostic versus therapeutic injections. So again, we, we don't have to belabor this point, but they have, to, they have to have pain prior to the injection. So if I have patients that come in and say, I get this terrible, sharp, lancinating leg pain four times a day. It occurs, I can't tell you when. It, it may occur after activity. It may not occur after activity. I'm at a stumped point because if you can't reliably reproduce your pain, and then Dr. Evans can anesthetize the structure, I'm not sure what's going on. And there are times when the workup takes forever simply because we don't have a reliable way to aggravate the symptoms. So no relief until a day or two later. So I get patients that come in from Kansas or Florida and they say, I've had a block and it was great. And you find out they had a block and they didn't have any relief for the first two days and then it was wonderful. And if I injected your knee with steroid and your back hurt, two days later you'd go, hey, this is the best thing in the world because you get a systemic response. What you have to be careful about is that if patients think it's a successful block, it may not be. Did I do that again? I think I did. So 
Do not use relief outside of the diagnostic window as a positive block and proof of the pain generator. If somebody gets no relief for three to five hours, but then a day later say it was great, doesn't tell me a thing diagnostically. So they need a pain diary. They have to fill this out and they have to split up their pain. So if we're gonna look at, let's say, the buttocks pain and the back pain, and they get an injection, so what's their pain before and what's their pain for the first three hours after? This guy had five to six level pain before the injection and zero to one, that was a positive diagnostic block. That tells me the structure that was injected and anesthetized was causing his pain. So you have to be careful about these. You can have a pressure wave injury. I've never seen one with Dr. Evans, but I commonly see this. If somebody's in a hurry, they put the needle in and they're just trying to drive that fluid in a small potential space, you'll get a pressure wave injury and people will be miserable for a day. So it's the technique of how to put this needle in and look for problems that is important. Lumbar facet blocks. So it's not as common for lumbar facets to cause pain, but you can see the medial branches that innervate these joints. If we're concerned about the joint itself causing pain, Dr. Evans can either do a medial branch block, so block the sensory nerves on the outside, or put the needle into the joint and do a capsular block. I don't know if there are certain companies that require one and then the other. Yeah, I mean, insurance companies are kind of changing their guidelines. Some say that you can use local anesthetic only. Some say you can use local anesthetic only with a steroid. Some specify going into the joint itself only or doing a medial branch block. So it's, it's constant shifting. Some insurance companies will tell you you have to do it twice before you can do a rate of frequency ablation. Uh, so it's a little bit of changing, changing guidelines from company to company. Well, if you get positive blocks times two, what do you do? you do a radio frequency ablation. So Dr. Evans has a needle tip that'll heat up under the influence of electricity so he can put it right on that medial branch and create a burn zone and kill it. And does it last forever? Unfortunately, most of the time, no, because peripheral nerves try and regenerate. How many times can you probably do a block before it becomes ineffective? And I have some patients, I've seen patients who are cured, one rhizotomy or radiofrequency ablation, and the pain goes away. So it can be effective, effective. But one thing you have to remember, these medial branches also supply the multifidi muscle. So you're going to de-innervate the multifidi muscle too, but does it matter? No, it creates 60 newton pounds of force, so it's not going to be a big deal in general. Well, the, the way the anatomy works is that in the lumbar spine, it comes in from the level above and the level below. So if you have a 5-1, you know, radio frequency ablation, you got to do L5 and S1, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, usually we try and just target the one level that's the most probable. Oh, okay. Because I've heard, I've heard some people say, well, two levels above and below, but yeah. Hey, Thos, how do you feel about medium branch blocks versus cassette blocks? Uh, I think the literature, what's coming out now in the Spine and Invention Society is, is they prefer medial branch blocks, but I mean, I think in, I was trained by a guy who did primarily intra-articular facet, whether it's surgical thoracic or lumbar, and I feel like the feedback we get from that is always better in certain cases. It's difficult to enter the thoracic spine. I feel the same way. It's almost like if you have a knee injection, right? Do you want to inject the knee intra-articularly, or do you want to block the femoral nerve? And that's some sort of an analogous representation. I don't know how you, what your thoughts are. It's a tough one. And I don't think you have to be in either camp. I think you can either say, hey, if this doesn't work, maybe try the other one, right? I have seen some cases where if you inject intracapsularly, you stretch the capsule, and they get increased pain because you haven't anesthetized the outside of the capsule. So I prefer medial branch blocks because that's what you're going to burn anyways. So you might as well numb the structure 
and see if you get relief, and that were, therefore the burn makes more sense, to me at least. I think it's a tech, technique issue, too. Getting the cervical cassette is not that hard. Getting the thoracic, very challenging, lumbar, somewhere in between. So I, I can argue with both ways, but I think ultimately insurance companies are going to be telling clients out Well, you guys know why Allstate is the good hands company, right? Because it holds on to your money and never lets it go. So that's unfortunately insurance companies are becoming harder to deal with. And speaking of that, they, sometimes insurance companies require a meter wrench block go for a rise right up, not a cassette block. Yeah. So there are older techniques that you'll still see around, people have had these IDETT or IDET, intradiscal electrothermal therapy, where you take a catheter and you wind it around the inside layers of a disc and you burn and cauterize the disc. And it was a great idea when it was invented, but it doesn't work too well and it can create issues. Percutaneous mechanical nucleoplasty, you put a cannula percutaneously into the disc and try and suck out as much of the disc material as you can. Doesn't make any sense to me, but it's still around. And then finally, there's the old chemonucleolysis, disc ablation with papaya enzyme. The nucleus of the disc will break down to liquid under the influence of papaya enzyme. The only problem is if it leaks out into the back of the canal, this papaya enzyme also dissolves the spinal cord. And so there's points off if you do that. And so obviously they've eliminated that, even though it was quite popular for a while. Discograms. Discograms can be wonderful, can be problematic. So this is the old days when I had Dr. Evans do a discogram probably some 10, 12 years ago. And discograms are valuable tools to determine pain. So let's go to the next slide. So a normal disc, when you fill up the nucleus and the dye spreads out, looks like a cotton ball. You can imagine the fibers of the annulus in the front and the back intact here. And here you can see dye spread out, so you've got a tear in the back of the disc. But this diagram or this image isn't important. The important thing is what pain is generated. So Dr. Evans will take a patient in, put them to sleep, give them sedation so they're out, drop needles into their spine, and then wake them up. Once the needles are in, you don't feel them. So they're relatively pain-free when they're woken up. And then he's going to interrogate the disc by attaching a syringe with a manometer to tell him pressure, and he's going to literally pressurize the disc while the patient's awake. To, we're looking for reproduction of back pain. We don't use this test a lot, but if we have a question of whether the pain generator is the back or not, it's a very helpful test to use. And this is what a normal disc looks like, where you can see the dye right in the center where the nucleus would be, and this is a big tear on the outside coming all the way around the disc. You can put in spinal cord stimulators. These are devices that stimulate the cord, not down to the lumbar spine, but stimulate the cord. And these devices, you remember when you're five years old and you're riding your bike and you hit your arm against a tree and your arm is throbbing. And so what did you do? You rubbed the heck out of your arm and what you did really was you were bypassing the pain system. Melzack and Wall almost won a Nobel Prize for this. It turns out there's a gate, and it's called the gate theory of pain, and if you stimulate one system, you can overcome the next system. So these devices create white noise to cover over pain. They're much more effective for leg pain than they are for back pain. Uh, they're designed to create white noise, as I said, and you flood a section of the nervous system with sensory stimulation, and you'll close the gate that controls the pain pathway to the brain. And it's harder to see, but there are little electrodes on each of these two leads, and they can be stimulated in different patterns. And that's what these spinal cord stimulators are designed to do. Um, they're best for controlling radicular pain, as I said, chronic nerve injury, arachnoiditis, or CRPS. They can occasionally give some relief of back pain, but generally are ineffective for back pain symptoms. And then finally, pain pumps. We'll deliver a planned aliquot of narcotic over a timed interval through a catheter inserted into the dural sac. So you have to take this catheter, 
It's inserted into the sac and it bathes the spine with narcotics. They have to be refilled through a thin needle and syringe every six weeks to six months. They're not generally that popular, but, and they become less effective over time, but it's some of the things that we can do. Questions? Wow. I see smiles, so at least people are awake. That's good. What about when the patient says, Doc, how many of these injections can I get in here? I personally tell them three to four. And I think that varies. I mean, if you're talking about just doing medial branch blocks, which is low with parts, they have local anesthetic in it, mm -hmm. and not a lot of steroids, or no steroid. Um, I think that number's a little less. If you're talking purely epidurals, yeah, I'd say somewhere between three to four, maybe five. Um, but if you're doing a rate of frequency ablation, there's really no steroid in that either. So the hard and fast number can be a little bit more. And yeah, there's a lot of hearsay, too, about injections causing osteopenia, localized osteopenia. I got to tell you, though, I don't see that. And in fact, I've operated on people who've had 20, 30 injections, maybe a little scar formation, but I don't see a big deal with it. Nonetheless, the steroid dose is the concern, I think. But not local, but systemic. And that's the thought, too, that a localized steroid obviously is very different. And I think that's the hearsay you have to talk to patients. It's very different modality of popping chronic steroids or whatever. And the data for the amount of, or the amount of steroids probably going to shift as well. It used to be 80 milligrams of catalog is higher, higher uh, concentrations. Often we'll see we get great effects by using 30% of that dose. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So now we're going to talk about what to do when nothing else works and you're looking at fixing people. So, what is the purpose of surgery? Well, you stabilize unstable segments, fractures and slips, as we talked about earlier. You eliminate painful motion. You cure infections and tumors. You decompress neurologic elements. You realign malaligned segments. And you restore normal spinal balance to reduce muscular stress and load. That's what it's for. There are indications for surgery. And if you understand these indications, you can advocate for your patient. There are times when surgery shouldn't be done. And you guys need to know when it should and when it shouldn't be done. And then you have to know what the expected results will be and what bad results are. So you've got to know about this. So you'll know when failure of conservative treatment should lead to surgery and when conservative care, even if it doesn't work, there's still not a surgical candidate. If you know this, it makes your life a lot easier. You can assess the results of surgery. So if somebody comes back from a surgery and they're having certain symptoms, would you expect that? Or is that wrong and you say, wait a second, let's look at another way. Something else is going on. So absolute indications, fracture instability, neural compression leading to motor weakness, cauda equina, cord compression, and significant progressive deformity. So if you remember these, it makes it easier. What are the relative indications? So have they failed conservative care? Leg pain due to root compression. Lower back pain due to slip, IDR, facet disease. All with the inability to do desired activities. If they want to go and play tennis and they've got a three-level bad back, I mean, no matter what Dr. Gill or I do, they're going to have a three-level problem and they're not going to be able to go back to play tennis. That's unrealistic. But if they want to walk their dog and do a little gardening and do dishes, yeah, we can help them, we can get them back. Neurogenic claudication, malaligned muscular pain with poor adapt adaptation mechanisms. Somebody's got a th severe thoracic hyperkyphosis, they're miserable, they can't stand, they can't do anything, can you help them? Yeah. What is the cost of helping them? And that leads to our next topic, contraindications. Can the patient tolerate the surgery? Are there medically ameliorable issues? If this is an 82-year-old female with severe diabetes, severe osteoporosis, with a T-score of negative 3.2, and she has miserable hyperkyphotic thoracic spine, we can hurt her. Now, unfortunately, there isn't much that you can do to help her because you can't, there's no bone to hold on to, so to speak. So what is the patient's T-score? Do they have osteoporosis? Do you have to treat that? 
Does the patient understand the expectations? So if I tell somebody there's a 90% chance of two-thirds relief of back pain with surgery, and they think they're going to be cured without any pain, they don't get surgery because their expectations are unrealistic unless I can train them to understand that they're going to be better but not perfect. Is the patient at high risk, diabetes type 1, coronary artery disease, age and stroke? Is the intensity of the surgical procedure and recovery greater than the benefits? So if you're planning on a big thoracolumbar fusion for degenerative scoli and they're malfunctioning already, then it, the surgery may be bigger than they should undergo. And for fusion patients, do they smoke and do alcohol? Because these both can reduce the amount of potential success. Yes? Do you operate Yes. Not that I like to, and, but I have a, a magic chemical that I'm not allowed to name here that we'll talk in private if you'd like. So why surgery? Well, look at this patient. Here's a normal canal, and this patient can't stand and walk, right? So you're going to leave them that way? I mean, is it dangerous to live with this? Probably not. Very small chance of cotaquina syndrome, but they can't walk. And you've done everything. You've done injections. You've done physical therapy. You've done chiropractic manipulation, and they're still miserable. Some people just simply need to be fixed. So lumbar herniation, the most common topic. When is surgery warranted? Well, they have motor weakness except for the EHL. So we talked about the tibialis anterior related to L5 and the EHL, but what if they have an L4-5 herniation, their left L5 root is compressed, and all they have other than leg pain is EHL weakness? Do you need to operate on them? Well, if they're a professional karate instructor or a professional goal kicker, maybe. But other than that, you can live without your EHL. So you don't have to jump on certain weaknesses versus others. If you have foot drop, you should jump on that. If you have EHL weakness, you don't have to wor worry about it as much. What's your time frame for uh, motor weakness with drop foot? As soon as possible for lumbar spine. Within a week, 10 days. There are people that have a two-week vacation planned, and they come in and they say, you know, I've got foot drop, I've got leg pain, and they get an epidural, and their pain goes away, but their weakness doesn't. They say, I've got a two-week vacation. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, finally got it out. So they want to go on that vacation. Yes, that does diminish the chance of recovery, but I think by small percentage points. Well, there's a difference. Now, if you have a motor strength deficit and in two weeks they've improved by half a grade, you can watch it. But there are studies out there that indicate that beyond three to six months, the results of a microdiscectomy diminish substantially. Even conservative care diminishes substantially. So I use the three to six month goal to say, let's give it some time. But unless it's pretty significant motor weakness, I'll fix them much more quickly. I would watch. If, if they're improving, I think it's reasonable to keep an eye on them. Like week by week is what I would say. You know, it's a 55 year old who can't go to work and do a 30 minute operation and they love you forever, right? It's, it's amazing. Now, just to parlay a little bit more to that, is that some people with a dense deficit, meaning two out of five or less, mm -hmm. so they don't have significant anti gravity strength, even if you jump on them that night, a large proportion of people don't get better. It's a sad reality of what we do. And, you know, we can tell them, but gosh, you know, if you're a diabetic, a smoker, if you have, uh, you know, all sorts of other, maybe you have some type of chemical exposure, you might have a lower success rate. But even if Don or I had a near foot drop and we had an operation within a week, we may not get better if we're a dense neurologic deficit. So the happy situation, like Dr. Corman was saying, is that you're three out of five or, or, or uh, better and you 
can't get them quickly. If Boss is in his office, calls up Dr. Corn and says, hey, this is an important lens of shirt, and you know, that's the way it should go. Sitting on it's a very uncomfortable thing, and I think depending on where you are and uh, what region you are, it's just your tolerance for error, I guess, maybe is the way to say it, kind of. Yeah, that's, I've had a couple in California cases. One was an attorney who's probably decreased his, a bit of my daughter, but they, his pain went away the moment he got the drop of it. He had that twice. And then he, he chose the surgeon actually one to have the surgery. And he, he said, well, I can live with drop foot. Well, if you can live with drop foot, that's fine. I mean, I mean, you don't have to jump into anything. You can live with cauda equina syndrome and, you know, <laughs> stimulate your bowel and bladder every day. It depends on what your tolerance is, but unfortunately, these things tend to not get better quickly and have a better chance with decompression. We're actually doing a study now to determine the exact percentages because we collect all of our data and we can go back now 15 years, but we don't have it up yet. I think yes. you got it going, sorry, you got it going this a long time ago, you told me about painless weakness. Yeah. And those are the most humbling ones that we see. Because you, injections don't help that. Sorry, boss, we love you, but it's, just, it's not going to work. And that's where I think it really, a surgical solution might be best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I just one case in particular. He had severe pain and then went away, but got dropped, but all of a sudden, you know, just yeah. completely inflated. It's amazing what people are willing to live with. Yeah. Well, that's the number one thing. Are you willing to live with this? Excuse me. Do you have, do you have any relative contraindications for cognitive dementia? Is that sort of thing? Most people I see don't have dementia, except for some of my partners, maybe. That's another story altogether. <laughs> okay, we have a baby population. And there is a question of general anesthetic associated with some mental problems, but I haven't had that yet. I haven't run into it. I don't know, Dr. Gill, if you've... So, you know, Parkinson's is another form of dementia, and that's the more studied form of it. Because you can, it's very hard to say you get dementia, but you can study it. If you have Parkinson's, you can retrospectively look at those patients. And they've shown that they do have a very subtle increase in their symptoms meaning their gait is a little bit more difficult in a year after surgery. So and maybe not once, let's say you were expecting compression that surgery, is a So that, the scary. other thing that's important out is the less anesthesia you can give them, mm -hmm. the less side effects they potentially have. So if you can do a non-fusion operation, because a lot of these people actually fail their fusion because they have that chronic vibration going on with the cog drilling, the ratcheting, the hypertonicity. So weirdly enough, they have a lower fusion rate. So if you can choose an operation that may be not perfect, let's say they have an L45 fixed listhesis, right, where it doesn't really shift much on flexion extension. You say, you know, an ideal operation in most people's hands is a fusion. So maybe we'll do a decompression and see how we do it. A short operation, less side effects. That's where you can be comfortable. Anesthesia is real. I mean, really, you know, it's uh, as we age, it focuses us up a little bit. Have not. Have not. Have not. Yeah. They're already are on dementia slope. You're right. Like a cliff, you know, it's funny. So anecdotally, because um, I live in a place where there's a lot of retirees, is that I'll have them pick something they do th that they don't do. Meaning, if they love language, I say go pick up music. If you love to read, go pick up a, a sport that makes you use it your brain in a different way. And the bigger word, and I would be so proud of her saying this, is called neuroplasticity. Because mm -hmm. that's what she does, right? And that's really what we're trying to encourage when we see these people who are just sliding a little bit. So learn a different language. Pick up chess. Pick up something that uses your brain in a very different way. Like for me, it would be probably going and learning how to draw and be an artist in a very good watercolor. Right? That would like, exercise my brain very differently. So that's what I try to tell my patients. Hey, what else can you do? My biggest concern was ever really that they swallowed their questions. Oh, so, yeah. You're so right. Mess up everything you guys have done. Yeah, and, and then I, I give you that same story as my pops, who, you know, actually was three weeks ago, he got his deep impression of his captain. And then, you know, he just got a little foggy one day and fell. You know, he can 
That's why we're inventing airbag suits, so when they go over, it just pops up. That's another story altogether. So, oh, what we lost here. So, what is the surgical approach? So, it's a hemilaminotomy. So, you essentially, you don't take any structural bone. The facets are structural, the spinous is structural, but you only take a small portion, and you're trying to get into this interval right here. You do remove ligamentum flavum on the ipsilateral side, but it's a vestigial ligament that only causes problems in the future. So in general, there's no real structural change with this. Do you want to see what a microdiscectomy looks like in real video time? So the difference between that and this is volume. If you look at cauda equina syndrome, the entire canal is filled, and this should be operated on within 12 hours of symptom onset, and you guys know now what the symptoms are and what the examination is. Now the question is, do you want to see a microdiscectomy for cauda equina syndrome? So, what do you do to differentially diagnose continuous leg pain after a microdiscectomy? And this is not an uncommon event, as I, I have a website, I have a forum, people write in all the time. And the most common complaint is, I had a microdiscectomy, I still have pain, what's going on? So what can happen? Wrong diagnosis. So if you thought it was a 5-1 herniation, it was a 4-5 far lateral and you got it wrong, well, they're not going to get any better if you do that. The wrong level is involved. Recurrent disc herniation, 10 to 20%. So you, that hole in the disc that caused the herniation in the first place never heals, right? Disc is avascular, can't heal. So you have a chance 10 to 20% of recurrent disc. You can get scar, surprisingly, if somebody does surgery, and so you have to be meticulous about what you do, but scar does occur. Hematoma or seromas occur. You can have an incomplete decompression. As you saw in that last video, if I didn't pursue and continually look for more fragments and I said that was enough, that there still be more fragments in there. You can have a collapse of a foramen at the surgical site. Remember, all this jelly's coming out. What happens to the disc height? It gets lowered. That can cause foraminal stenosis. New onset compression at a different level, and you can have a chronic nerve injury. So you have to look for all these things. So what happens typically with these patients? The numbness takes about six months to resorb. The patch of numbness will contract over time. In fact, what's interesting is they'll have significant leg pain. You take the herniation out and they go, oh, doc, my leg is great, but how come it's numb? Well, it was numb, but because the pain overshadows numbness, they can't tell. Once you get the pain away, they can feel the numbness and they get a little pissy sometimes until you explain all that. So it's not unusual that you can still have some ache in the leg and as it returns with increased function. That can draw a short course of an oral steroid occasionally. And if the pain in my book is greater than a visual analog score five or six, you need a new MRI because you want to see a seroma or recurrent herniation. Recurrent herniation or a seroma very commonly, if Dr. Evans can put a needle into that area and aspirate the seroma, put a little steroid in, takes care of the problem. And you don't want athletes to compete in competitive activities for eight to 12 weeks. Normally, most people get better in six to eight weeks. We want them to start, at least I, I don't know if you use therapy. I like all my people to start therapy at 10 days and go for six weeks. And your job is to educate them and make sure they don't do something stupid. I say sometimes the harder part of the therapy. Yeah. The operation is just, you know, walking apart. Yeah, it's true. So recurrent disc herniations. Here's a patient who had a disc herniation at 5-1. Four months later, no surgery or anything. Look at the size of the herniation. Once you have a tear of the back of the disc, as you know, that tear never heals. It's a permanent defect in the wall, and you can have recurrent herniations. I like to say 10 to 20% with or without surgery. It's a little less without surgery than with. So you can have lateral recess stenosis. As you can see here, you can see the left nerve root is freed. The right is a little squashed, or you can see a bad facet and a ganglion cyst. 
Ganglion cyst surgery is just like anything else, but ganglion cysts can be adhesive or non-adhesive. The difference is taking a balloon and putting it in uh, a tube, and if the balloon is not covered in glue, you pop the balloon, you can pull it out, and there's no adhesion. But these cysts can also be adhesive and very difficult to remove, and sometimes you can't pull the entire, entire wall out, and you just have to ablate it slowly. So it depends how it works. Degenerative spondylolisthesis, as we talked about, oh, sorry. So what surgery is warranted? If you've got slips that are unstable and you've got central stenosis, most of the time you have to consider a fusion because if you do a decompression, what are you doing? You're opening up the canal and removing some of the facet that is ingrown into the canal. That facet has been enlarged to try and stabilize that level. If you're trimming some facet out to free up the nerves, what's going to happen to stability? Become even worse. But there are times, as Dr. Gill mentions, that you don't want to necessarily do a big surgery on somebody, so you try and do a smaller surgery in the hopes they won't destabilize. You don't burn any bridges. If you have to do a fusion later, you can do it. But the whole key is to try and figure out what the best surgery is for the patient. So again, what do you do if you have lower, no lower back pain, no significant slip, no instability, no collapse or angular deformity, but you have this. They have neurogenic claudication. So you do a laminotomy. You can do it single or bilateral. What you're doing is preserving most of the spinous. You're doing a little bit of removal of the inferior lamina and you're removing most of the ligamentum flavum. And that procedure gives them great relief. So pre-laminotomy here, you can see significant stenosis, post-laminotomy here. But is there something that's on this one that's not on this one? Huh? Facet. So even though we do a simple little decompression, the facet can start to fail. And that is one part and parcel of the problem with these patients. Again, a 4-5 problem here, a simple laminotomy decompression, and they no longer have stenosis. And this is what an x-ray looks like. It's a very simple, small opening. If you do it small enough, sometimes it's hard to see that any surgery has been done. Uh, we won't talk about the differences here. So fusions. Why do we want fusions? That sounds terrible to me. Well, you join two or more vertebrae together with a living bridge of bone to stop painful motion of the discs, facets, eliminate instability, or restore alignment due to collapse of the angulation. So you have a foraminal collapse at 4 or 5. The right foramen is obliterated. If I don't do a fusion and I take out just a little bit of bone in there, what's going to happen? going to recollapse even further. Most of them get worse. So you have to do a fusion in certain patients. If you've got a patient with a grade 2 slip and it's unstable and you do a decompression, it's going to get worse, right? Sometimes you have to do a fusion. And if you have an IDR disc. So this is what a fusion looks like. You can use any, it doesn't matter what instrumentation you use, but you have to immobilize the area and if in a T-lift, you can actually restore the disc height by putting a little plastic spacer, the most expensive plastic you'll ever see, by the way. But you need to buy stock in Medtronic for that. So this is what a T-lift looks like. And again, we talk about healing. It takes, depending on what material you use to cause a fusion, it takes between four, and, four months and 12 months for a fusion to occur. And actually, back in the old days, it took as long as 16 months. And again, you use pedicle screws and rods just to hold the vertebra together. You can use a spinous process clamp. We don't, I don't know if Dr. Gill uses them, but they're bad ideas in general. I hope you don't use them, sorry. Discal spacers. Uh, you, can, uh, you can manipulate the segment, and it speeds rehabilitation. You want to avoid non for three months because bone healing is inflammation. If you stop inflammation, you can stop healing, right? You can give steroids in short courses. You have to be careful with patients that are taking supplements. Are you on any drugs? No, no. But I'm on ginseng and guarana and all these things, and these are anticoagulants, so you have to be careful about them. Patients with diabetes and alcoholism don't heal as well. 
Cigarette smoking kills osteocytes and osteoporosis. There's a patient we had who had a fracture that had to be fixed and we had to put her on emergency forteo. That's a calcium agonist, if I'm not mistaken. Parathy thank you, parathyroid. So benefits, direct decompression, decompress the canal, removal of the facet, open the foramen, you get autogenous bone graft from the facet and all done through one small posterior incision. I think we won't spend our time on that. Yes, they're all, I put everybody in a brace, a soft corset for three months to remind them. I don't push them for BLTs for three months. They can walk, they can drive, they can even get on a stationary bike or an elliptical, but they can't do any BLTs for three months. Same, exact same protocol. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. What are your thoughts on CBD and marijuana after? Well, marijuana smoking is not a good idea. Marijuana edibles, I'm, the jury's still out. I'm not sure. I don't know, Dr. Gill, do you yeah. use edibles? So obviously, we have a different legal system where I'm at, and we don't have a lot of conversations about marijuana. We have a lot of conversations about CBD. Um, there's been some, not randomized control, but if you will, there's been some prospective studies that have shown that people have a lower narcotic usage if they add CBD into their profile. Polypharmacy, and a pretty safe way of doing polypharmacy, right? It's kind of like saying, okay, we're gonna add Neurontin, maybe some Balta, and an NSAID, and that way you don't have to take opioids. So, I think CBD does have a utility in augmenting the pain relief that people get post-operative and maybe even pre-operative. So I, I like it, I'm a, I'm a fan of it, I recommend it. It's so uncontrolled, that's the hard part. So how do you say, hey, go to CBD store on the corner of Elm and Main and get it there, or do you go to the CBD store in the village and get it there? So it's uncontrolled, but I do think there's a utility. There you go. I'm still undecided. Dr. Gill has, yeah, it's hard to know what's going to happen. Okay. So we won't spend the time with every specific disorder, but if you have something like this, a grade three ismic spondylolisthesis, you can treat that all day long and you're never going to reduce that. And unfortunately, the slip can progress, so they do need fusions. And again, for these, the indications are a progressive slip, grade two or larger, back pain with failed treatment, radiculopathy that's failed, and motor weakness. And again, you can reduce them somewhat, but the key is not to pull them back too far because the L5 root, which comes out right here, when you pull them back, the further you pull them back, the more you stretch the root. And when I was training years and years ago when dinosaurs walked the earth, I've seen a couple of L5 nerves that didn't respond well to the stretch. So I never reduce them more than a half a grade to a grade in general. Again, there's posterolateral fusions. You guys don't need to do this. There's A-lifts, so you can go in front if you have a pseudoarthrosis, and you can go ahead and fix this. There's oblique lateral antibody fusions or X-lifts, so you make an incision through the side, go through the psoas muscle, put this cage, and then put screws in back. So there's different ways to create a fusion. There's artificial discs, and there are a lot of people who may like these. I'm not a fan, and the reason is hip and knee joints are solo joints, so you can replace a joint and cover the entire joint. When you do this, all you're covering is the disc. You're not covering the facets. There's no shock absorption here, so it doesn't work like a normal disc. It doesn't absorb impact. All it does is allow motion. And so if this thing is put in in the front and it fails, how do you get it out? Well, you've got adhesions to the vena cava and to the aorta and to the iliac vessels, and it can be a life-threatening event to try and get that out. So I'm not a fan of these guys. Although I have some things coming up that I can't talk about today that's biological that we'll, we'll eventually get to in the lecture next year maybe. But I, no, I can't talk about it. I think so. the biggest criteria that we are 
lacking these lumbar disc replacements, there's no shock absorption. Right? Think about that. That's the base of where your axial skeleton meets this rigid pelvis. And you're sticking a shim in there. So that's where I struggle with the utility of the disc replacement. And you know, people want tangible examples, right? So we always use the example of Peyton Manning with ACD and F. You know, he went back, won a Super Bowl. And we talk about Tiger, right? Tiger could have had anything. And um, you know, he had a fusion and L5 is one A lift with a, a sentinel cage up front and screws in the back. So it's a very, very utilitarian surgery that can bring people back to however level, whatever level they want to rehab to. And if you compare the results of an ADR, oops, sorry, of an ADR and a fusion, they're almost exactly the same. And I defy you to be able to determine range of motion better with this device than with a fusion at one level. So ADRs fail. This is a guy who was a, a, a Marine. And you can see, do you see the end plate here and how it's fallen into the vertebral body? So these things have to withstand impact. And as after a while, this thing failed and he was miserably painful. And you can't go back in the front and open it up and get it out because the adhesions to the vena cava, again, can kill him as we do the approach. Uh, and there's other times, for example, this guy came from Germany. And would you guys remember the total normal range of motion of the lumbar spine at L5-S1 is about 20 to 25 degrees. You want to try, if you can, restore height to have that, half that. But this disc was put in too thick, and the range of motion is 20 degrees, and this guy's pain is much worse now than it was prior to the insertion of the disc. Now, this is not for the cervical spine, because cervical spine discs can be retrieved and fixed. This is only for lumbar spine. So this guy, he is now five months later, chronic pain unchanged. Look at his range of motion now. It's almost zero, right? He's flexing and he's extending, and here's 13 degrees and about 11 degrees. So his disc, because it was put in too tight, has gone on to fibrose, and what does he have? He has now back pain with no better range of motion than he had before. So there's interspinous kyphogenic devices. I don't think any of us use them up here, but you'll find guys who want to be the latest and greatest. And so the whole idea, right, with the lumbar spine, if you have stenosis, you want to flex the body forward to open up the canal. Well, this device jams in between the two spinuses, so it keeps the canal open only at that one level until it erodes into the spinous processes. And then now you have a painful device and you have stenosis. These are devices that are spring-loaded clips that are supposed to be put in between the spinuses. Look at the kyphosis here. So it's a forced kyphosis. Why don't you simply just do a central laminotomy decompression and open the canal? Makes sense. Nope, let's try something new and shove something in there that doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry, I get a little upset about some of these things. So if you're going to do a fusion, do a fusion with pedicle screws. This guy used a clamping device and small screws in the facets. And guess what happened? Pseudoarthrosis. Just do the right thing the first time and you don't have to worry about it. This is another kyphogenic device. I have a whole drawer, drawer full of these if you want to see what they look like. So, and then we won't talk about kyphoplasty. We talked about that before. So, foraminal collapse, what do you do when you have a foramen that's collapsed? You can't do a decompression. You can do a rotor rooter job, but what's going to happen? That thing is collapsing onto the facet, right? So, you open up the facet and you take the bone away, and it collapses further. It needs a fusion, unfortunately. Again, as we talked about foraminal collapse, and we won't, we'll just very talk, very quickly talk about pars fractures. So there are certain kids that have pars fractures that should be fixed and ones that are going to be a challenge to fix. So if the fracture is distracted three millimeters more or bilaterally atrophic, they're going to have a poor surgical result. But this is what a repair looks like. And you can see this is, I think, three years after the repair. Range of motion's great, no slip. 
and the kid is playing soccer. Yes? Just to clarify, your, your intent Yeah. Yeah. Well, here you can see, this was five months down the road. Oh, goodness, here. Five months down the road, and I was, I was seeing this side healing. This side was questionable, but here's eight months down the road, and you can see the whole thing's healed in. I use a special sauce, so to speak, to fix these that I'm not allowed to talk about, but uh, it works very nicely to get these to heal. So you can fix Schurman's kyphosis. This is a kid from Canada where they said there's nothing wrong with him except for the fact that he has a 72 degree short curve and he had miserable pain for 15, no, 10 years. And so you can see that he has a significant lumbar lordosis, starting to get back pain because of facet imbrication and his angulation was quite severe. This is what he looked like where he's actually developing fusion anteriorly and so you can take these miserable 77 degree curves and have them. And his pain is gone. You can see the cages inside. So you can fix things like this. They're monumental tasks. This is a whole day of working. But you can fix these kinds of things and create a balanced spine and his pain is gone now. Again, we won't spend our time in scoliosis, but you can fix these. Uh, this, one, this is a patient who I asked not to ski anymore. And so eight, nine months from surgery, she sent me a picture of her going down double blacks in Aspen. So you can't trust patients. Uh, and you can take miserably painful curves with angular collapses and lateral translations and fix them. What I like to tell my patients is you're taking a painful, movable, barely movable, but movable spine, and you're trading pain for no pain, and you're trading motion for stiffness. And so most of them have to get to the point that they're miserable before we talk about fixing this. Questions? Yes? Um, 